Okay, so we were introduced to the concepts of uh, object-oriented programming. So um, we talked about abstraction and we talked about encapsulation. So uh, I went over like some high-level definitions, which um, doesn't really explain like what what abstraction or encapsulation is, but I'm hoping that with some examples today, then we can um, get a very good understanding uh, about these two terms, right? Because it, these two are the building blocks for object-oriented programming, abstraction, encapsulation, and then there'll be inheritance, and then there'll be polymorphism, right? But we get we have to get through this ones first, and if you can understand this ones, then uh, we can build with uh, the other two concepts. So abstraction, right? So dealing with the appropriate level of details focuses on the outside view of an object, right? So it's kind of like, <laughs> you know, so uh, if we diagram an example with uh, what's known as a class diagram, so uh, UML uh, class diagram, not a memory diagram, right? This is like what uh, designers use when they're creating classes. Actually, they, they used to a lot before, like before, uh, like in their late 90s, early 2000s, UML was big and a lot of uh, programming shops wanted programmers to create a diagram, kind of like a flowchart, but a class is a diagram. The, the problem was that sometimes a diagram uh, was incorrect, right? So then they kind of shifted more to like, well, let the code drive the design with test cases. And that's what most companies do now, mainly because there's tools that can read your code and create these diagrams for you. So uh, if we have a, a class, right? Uh, and then we have the name, uh, say like the bank account, the bank account class. So that's a class name. Like we're not we're not worried right now about the syntax. We'll get to it, but I think we need to understand uh, what abstraction means and what enca encapsulation means. Then when we go to the code, then hopefully we're like, oh, okay, so I, now I know who, where we're headed, right? So so up here I have a bank, ATM, and teller, right? So recall I said in, in object-oriented programming, you you uh, model a small piece of the real world, in this case, the banking domain. So we have a bank and then we have an ATM and then we have a teller, okay? So if I'm if I'm a teller object, right? I'm modeling a teller, bank teller. Then I want to interact with the bank account. And maybe like I'm a senior citizen, right? And I'm like, I hate using ATMs. So I want to go and I want to speak to a person. And I I know I can call, you know, but I'm set in my ways. So I need to talk to someone. And so I approach a teller and the teller is like, yes, what do you need? And I'm like, well, I need my bank account balance. So then this teller object can interact wants to interact right with the bank and uh, the only way we can interact if is we do is if we define the get balance function okay and then plus in uh, class diagrams means that it's public okay we'll, we'll get into that in layman's term, it means that another object can see that bank account has a get balance function. So in essence, we can we can see kind of like a lever, right? And we're like, oh, that's the get balance lever. So now the teller can ask the bank, hey, uh, what's the balance for this customer? And then the bank account uh, it's like, oh yeah, let me get you the balance, right? And then the teller uh, 
gets the balance and then it can give the balance to the customer, right? Like, uh, I don't know, like uh, give balance to customer or something like that, right? And then we have the customer here who's like asking questions, right? So then the customers like, and then we have another lever here and it's like, oh, so that one's also public, right? So a very simple example to show us how objects interact with each other, right? Now, if I'm uh, if I'm like a younger generation person, maybe like I don't I hate talking to humans, right? And I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go to the ATM, right? Because I can interact with the machine, and I've been uh, dealing with devices all my life, so this is very intuitive to me, right? And I put in my card, I enter my PIN, whatever, and then I'm like, well, I'm in college and I'm poor, and I need to see if I, how much money I have and we're like oh, okay so let's call get balance right and then the ATM maybe has an option for us display balance right so internally uh, the ATM objects like oh so bank account has a get balance function so hey give me the balance for this customer and then it displays uh, the balance for us right and since we're college students we're like oh I guess I can go to Whataburger, right? So some, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was there. Uh, yeah. Okay. So questions here. So this is what abstraction means, right? Like objects interact with each other with uh, functionality that a developer has made available. For these objects to talk to each other. So, questions here? No questions here. Yeah. So, so that's the abstraction piece, right? Like we we model the banking domain, right? Obviously, a very simple model. And then we're just trying to get a very good understanding of abstraction, and we're like, oh. Okay, so that's what abstraction is. Okay, so then we jump to encapsulation. And we're here, and recall that I was saying that when we go to the bank, whether we talk to a teller or an ATM, they need something from us, and that's the account number. And then they verify that, that we are who we say we are, and then they type in that info, info into the computer or we type it into the ATM but that ATM has to go to some DB some database that has our information right like our database is not in the computer's memory when we're not there it's only there when we go right so we again draw the bank account class I'll just say account so that's the name of the class and uh, and now we are talking about encapsulation it's the easiest definition is variables and functions in a class Right. So remember uh, how you code with functions. Uh, you may have uh, functions that have local variables. And then in main, you might have variables that live in main that are fed into the function. But now, like to tackle uh, complexity and to tackle like issues with functions per uh, Programmers in the 70s and 80s were like, well, what if we create an object that encapsulates variables and functions that work together to do something for an object, in this case, an account, right? So that's encapsulation. And if we read the, yeah, they're only available to the class, yeah. So if we go back here, variables and functions in the class, right? Only the object has access to its data. Only the object can make changes to its data, hides secrets from other objects, right? So let's try to understand what that is. So, 
So we were saying, well, maybe uh, the account class has, I'll work with integers because they're easy to work with, okay? Has some balance, right? And uh, it's not it's not public, so we put a minus sign, meaning it's private. Meaning other objects or other classes do not know that balance exists. Okay, so we can still have the get balance as public. And I should have put an int here. But then recall I was saying the balance it has to be retrieved from somewhere. And uh, usually there's another class, maybe like the account DB class. Okay, and the account DB class is maybe fed into the account, but we're, we're gonna pretend that it's already in here, right? And maybe in here there's a private function uh, get balance from DB, and in there, like that account DB class knows how to go and retrieve data from a database. The ATM object, all it does is request get balance. And I mean, it, it doesn't know that there's an internal variable balance and it doesn't know that this is how we get the balance. All it wants is the balance. Like, I don't care how you get it, just give me the balance, right? So this right here is an example of encapsulation, okay? So when, uh, and then this guy will simply uh, display balance to the ATM customer, right? So I just, I choose the option display balance internally. Somebody programmed that functionality. Uh, if I choose that option, then go get balance and then accounts like, oh, Oh, okay, the customer ID is one, two, three, four, five. Let me get balance. Okay, let me retrieve it from the DB. Okay, I got it from the DB. Let me assign the value to balance and then in balance, uh, get balance probably only has return balance as its code, right? So, so this is the get balance code, return balance, and then ATM displays the balance to the user, right? But before this happened, uh, all of these activity uh, happen, right? Like get the balance from the DB, uh, populate balance, and then finally retrieve balance, right? We're not gonna go in, into that detail in this class, right? But I feel that if you see what encapsulation is, then hopefully you're like, oh, okay, so now I, at least I know the difference between uh, abstraction and encapsulation, right? Abstraction is like, what can, how can these objects talk to each other? And then encapsulation is like, uh, what is what are the internals of objects that other classes are not aware of, right? Encapsulation. Questions here? Okay, so no question. What was the DB again? What was that for? What did that stand for? DB, the balance DB. Database. Oh, okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. So yeah, this could be a database, right? And and in this database, there's a lot of customer records. So um, assuming this guy's ID was one, two, three, four, five, then the one, two, three, four, five uh, customer IDs record is gonna be retrieved and sent back to get the balance, right? So let me put here a uh, customer ID. Yeah, so. Again, this class is not about databases, but I still feel that this example hopefully gives you an understanding of why encap encapsulation is required or needed. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so let's uh, write some code, right? So let's let's start with get balance first, and uh, again. Any questions on the meaning of 
private and public functions. So if you're still, uh, when you, okay, go well, ahead. Sorry, uh, when you say you add a uh, plus a plus or a minus, uh, do you mean just when you define the function, there's just a plus in front of it? No, this is just in the diagram. Like remember, this is kind of, this is oh, like okay. a class diagram, right? So okay, yes, it's just identified in a diagram, but it's yeah, public. but not not in programming. In programming, we'll see how it's done. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but in 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 short, anything that's private. Another class cannot see. Anything that's public, another class can see and can call it, right? So ATM can say, hey, account, dot get balance, right? Give me your balance. And then it displays the balance to the customer. If ATM's like, oh, I see balance there, let me say account dot balance, and C will say, uh, that's uh, private access. You cannot access that variable, and the program will not compile. And we'll demonstrate that. Okay, let me go here. So if you're lost, don't don't lose hope, right? Sometimes it remember it took me a while learning it when I was in, in school in the early nineties. So Sometimes it takes a while before it's kind of like, whoa, now I know what that guy was trying to explain to me, right? So, so don't lose hope if it's if you're kind of like, what is this guy talking about? Back then, the professor wouldn't uh, um, post videos, but I will post videos for you. Let me see here. Uh, does not contain. Okay, what that is. Uh, module. Yeah, for some reason, this online compiler adds extra stuff to my code, and I've not really investigated what that is, so it blows my programs. But it's this extra folder that it adds for me. I don't know why it does. I guess I should just mute those, right? Okay. Uh, I think that's what I'll do, so I don't have to mess around with that. And I think this one's seven. Let me see. Nope, not seven. Um, six. Okay, six. Six, and then I have to do the same to test. See, I added this folder here. I'm still not sure why it does that. Okay. Six, okay. You don't have to worry about this on your local computer. It's just, I see it here too. Okay. Let me go to six. Let me go to the bank account class. And uh, so the syntax, right, for classes is very simple, right? So the keyword class and then the name. Uh, I guess I'll say bank account. Open close parentheses and then make sure you put a semicolon here. Okay. Otherwise, you put them on a compiler. Okay. So I was talking about public and then I was talking about private. So those are uh, known as access specifiers. So we actually use the keyword public for public. Anything uh, in C++ that falls, for example, if we create a variable here, like integer balance, then, then this is private. Right? But uh, we always want to be explicit 
when we program to avoid any confusion, right? So then we put it under the private access specifier. And then we can say, okay, I want to create one function uh, that returns uh, balance. We're working with integers purposely because then we don't have to mess around with doubles, right? <clears throat> okay, so what have we done here? So we tried to code this example. I'm not going to worry about get balance from DB yet. Okay, we'll come back to that later and uh, we'll mimic that. We'll create, a, we'll use a random number generator to give us the balance, right? But for now, uh, we'll stay simple. Okay, so, so we create a class bank account, uh, get balance. Okay, so recall with functions, you define a function and say the function is like hello world then in main you simply say hello world and then that function is loaded onto memory and it displays hello world uh, with a class if uh, you recall from python and it's just like a blueprint right a class is a blueprint for objects we can create and it's like the string uh, c++ object that we've been using uh, a string uh, you create a variable then you can use it so with a class, it's the same concept. We have to create a variable for the bank account, name that variable something. At that time, we can use it. Okay, so we'll demonstrate this. Let me go to main. Uh, okay, so bank account, I think we're good for now. Okay, so... Uh, bank account cpp okay so include bank account header okay so when we say uh, get balance with a semicolon the same concept that holds for creating functions in the header holds for classes this means uh, telling C++ uh, we will provide a function code later. So it's kind of like a promise to us. I mean, from us to C++ and we're like, hey, I'll give you the code later. And we have to do that before we try to compile. If we don't, our program unfortunately will not compile. So we come here and we're like, okay, so it returns an integer. And uh, the main difference between creating functions um, the, like the ones we've been using before, the, the keyword, the official uh, name for those are free functions, right? Meaning they're free, they don't belong to a class. And a class function is with the class function, we're like, okay, so uh, int uh, bank account class scope operator get balance right? so now here we're saying oh, okay so my function returns an integer it belongs to the bank account class and the name is get balance so now we're saying that we are go going to provide the code for the for this function okay and then here we simply say uh, return balance and that's how we create a public function. Questions here? So we're going to be working with quite a few files for this one. Well, eventually, but initially it'll just be, I mean, I think you'll end up working with eight files by the end of the tic-tac-toe program. But I mean, we're gonna start easy, right? You'll start with two and then it'll go to four and then to six and then finally to eight, so. I mean, if you can program with four classes, you can program with a hundred classes. That's the thinking here, right? We're not gonna go crazy. We're not gonna go too easy, but we're not gonna go like too hard either, right? So I think four classes is enough to like drive you crazy, so. Okay, so. Yeah, Professor, uh, yeah, I just had one other question. Um, is this going to be similar at all uh, 
when in, in Python, when you uh, created a class, you had to initialize attributes to it as well as uh, create the functions that were associated with it. Is that is there anything similar to the attributes in this also? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. It'll it'll show up today, right? So um, since I started talking about uh, functions here, right, then then I didn't want to talk about like something else and then come back to this. The concept you're talking is constructors, right? So we'll, we'll get to them today. Uh, okay. But I just want to make sure that I make the transition from this and from this to code, right? That way, hopefully, students can, can follow me. Okay, so now we created our object. And in main, uh, we have to, first of all, help our compiler. So include a bank account header. And then we can say a bank account account. So that this is what I mean. Like, so we created the blueprint. What's the blueprint? This is the blueprint. Now we have to create an instance or a variable, right? So we're like the bank account object I've just created, go ahead and create a variable for it. That's nothing that you've not done before. The only thing we're doing now is we're creating our own data types. You have to do this for integers, you have to do them for doubles, you have to do them for the string object, for the vector, right? You have to create a variable. So here, uh, that's what we are doing. And once we do that, then we can say like uh, get balance, right? So we can call get balance. And we don't have, uh, I guess we have balance, right? We can, can try to do that, but it, it will not compile. Let me go ahead and include ISTREAM here. Again, this should be familiar to you just to output data. So we can say account. Uh, get balance and then we can maybe display some text here balance and a new line character okay so nothing different right recall with the string we created like string name and then we could say like name dot size and at that time i told you somebody had to write code that understands of what we mean like with size and then they give us the size of the string. So now here we are writing our own code and we're like get balance and we're like, oh, we gotta return the bank account balance, right? So that's what we did here. We returned the balance to the user, okay? Uh, let me try my luck with compiling after all those errors I saw at the beginning. So let me see here, uh, go here. Let me see what's still in there. Uh, SRC, okay, SRC. Um, oh, this guy has to go. Okay, let me try again. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm going to SRC examples run in terminal. And uh, balance zero, zero. And that was okay, balance zero. Okay, so let's see what we did here. So balance, uh, get balance and we return balance and then we created an instance of an object or a variable right i know instance kind of like what so we create a variable account of type bank account and then we simply display the balance and by uh, using account dot get balance right so questions here Okay, so crystal clear. Okay, so we're like, let's go back to our code. And we know that in real life, 
um, usually bank accounts have some kind of balance, right? So, <clears throat> well, let me do try to do one thing here. I'll try to run this piece of code, right? Account dot balance. And notice uh, it's not happy with me. So uh, it's saying uh, there's an issue here. And that issue is because balance is private, okay? So why is it private? Well, because we make that variable private. So that is uh, the concept of encapsulation, right? So we want to protect the bank account's balance. We don't want other very other classes. Uh, we don't want it to access balance directly. Instead, we will, uh, after they follow our rules, we will let them update the balance, but they have to follow our rules, right? So we'll have a deposit and a withdraw function that we'll create in a little bit. But that's the, the main reasoning for encapsulation. We protect their data integrity, okay? So I go back here and then I control Z. So this should compile now and it should run. Because get balance is public, meaning other objects have access to get balance. Okay. If get balance is shifted to private, then the code will not compile because then I've in essence, I've hidden get balance from the main uh, region of code. Okay. So now we want to initialize uh, get balance, right? So, so we introduce the concept of a uh, constructor. So a constructor is a special function that has the exact same name as the class. And here we can pass in uh, parameters, like in a function. And then we can uh, pass that parameter into balance. And then here, notice we have open close uh, curly brace, meaning an empty function code, right? Because I mean, we we don't really have anything to do other than in this function other than to initialize balance. Okay. When we is do that going to be is that going to be the case one hundred percent of the time, or is there a, an instance where you would have something there? Yeah, sometimes you have something here. Yeah. Reason right now is like I just want us to focus on this functionality right here, how this works, right? So we have an incoming uh, parameter. And then we say balance, and then open close parenthesis B, meaning like assign the value of B into balance. So that's what we're telling the compiler to do. So uh, once we create one constructor, then C++ uh, it tells us, oh, okay, so you know what you're doing. So now like you're on your own. And let me explain what that statement means. So if I go back here and I'm like, okay, so let me go ahead and, and run this program. And then you can see it's already frowning at me right there, right? So then we we get all these issues, right? And we're just like, whoa. So what happened here, right? So let me come back here to header and let me remove this statement and then obviously it should compile right and it should run and it does but what's going on here right so by default c++ creates an empty constructor for us known as the default uh, synth uh, fancy words like synth uh, Synthesize constructor creates it by 
default if we don't have any other constructor, okay? Okay, so by default, it creates that for us. That's kind of like uh, in in main, right? So main.cpp, uh, if we don't add return zero behind the scenes, C++ adds it. But here we're dealing with objects with classes. So if we do not add any constructor, C++ creates one of these for us. And it creates it so that we can execute code like this, okay, so we can create a variable of our type. So I should be able to run this code, and I'm able to run it. In here, I mean, if I want to, in the function code, I can say uh, balance equals 100. Okay, so let me run that code. And notice when I say return balance and it it returns 100 okay but usually we don't we don't do stuff like that okay but I just wanted to show you that we can change values here okay so now if I go here now I'm telling C++ I'm taking control of the constructors I know that if I create one constructor I have to either create the default constructor myself. Why? Well, to be able to execute code like this. And why am I creating this, uh, this one on line six? Well, maybe I want to create a constructor, I mean, a bank account with a begin balance, right? So then I'm like, okay, so uh, bank account, account one, uh, $100. And then I want to say uh, account one, account one dot get balance. So now I have two variables. This is nothing uh, different than doing like int a equals five, and then int b equals ten. In memory, I have slot for A and slot for B. So here in memory, I have slot for account and I have memory slots for account one, okay? They are not the same bank account, okay? I created two different bank accounts. Questions here? Okay. Let me go ahead and change this one to account. And then I will go ahead and run it. And then we will diagram this to memory. Okay, so notice here 0 and 100. So account 0 and then account 1, 100. If we come back, recall our friend the stack. We're not dealing with the heap, okay? The heap is always present, but in this example, there's no heap memory, okay? So we have a, we have a, oh, that's the Python class. Account, let me copy uh, this. Okay, so we have a bank account and account one, obviously in main, and by now we should have a very good understanding that main gets its block of memory. Okay, and then we're like, okay, so let me do something here, uh, not you, right here. Uh, 
think that's the correct syntax. Uh, let me run this piece of code. So four, four bytes, okay? Four bytes, why? Well, because we have an integer and an integer has four bytes, right? So let's write some lines here. Okay, so assuming we're still in four bytes, so some x 96, 92, 88, right? So, so maybe, uh, remember, uh, a stack frame is loaded onto main, right? So, but we have a count, so maybe a count memory is granted here, and then a count one memory is granted here. So, a very clear indication. And then we have, I think, balance zero and then balance 100, right? So a clear indication that they are two different variables, right? So, I mean, just the syntax should give it away for us. But in memory, more or less, this is how they would look, right? And classes, if they have more than one class variable, they'll take up more memory, enough to accommodate those variables that are in the class, okay? Here, there's only integer right so there's one one okay uh, questions here so everyone understands that right here we have two variables and everyone understands that this class uses this constructor and uh, this class initialization statement uses the second constructor, the one that has one parameter of integer b. And uh, we can, we have here, uh, we can demonstrate that, right? So we'll say uh, C out uh, default constructor. Uh, it was empty, but it's not right now. We will say uh, one param constructor. I guess we can say that, and then we can go ahead and run our code and see what happens. All right. So notice right here, account zero uses the default constructor. This one, and then the second statement in main that creates an account with a uh, begin balance of 100 uses the constructor with one parameter, right? So hopefully now you can see like, oh, okay, so I know what's happening now. Questions here? That's very understandable. I had a question. Um, did you initialize balance to zero somewhere? No. No, it, uh, it's a class variable and the default value will be zero. Okay. Yeah. Yep, so, okay, well, we're gonna use this class a lot. So this was just to show you the execution. <clears throat> I will not need it anymore. And that keeps our class simple. Okay, so, You will see many questions in quizzes and in the final exam about constructors. So you have to make sure you understand how they work, okay? So recall, if we do not provide any constructors, C++ creates that one in the behind the scenes for us. We don't see it, but it, it'll create it for us. Once we decide to take control and we create one constructor, then C++ will not generate the default constructor for us, the synthesized constructor. We have to provide it, okay? And maybe the question is, well, what if we don't, what if we don't want it? Right, well, in the next lecture, we'll cover like how we handle those cases. But for now, like we want to understand what C++ is doing to try to drive us crazy, right? Hopefully, uh, not too confusing, and uh, 
we can move on from this one. Let me see here. Um, okay, so we covered uh, access specifiers, private and public, uh, private functions, which we do not have one. Maybe. Uh, Maybe we create one eventually. Well, not today. I will create one in the next class, though. Let me go back to the agenda, make sure I cover everything. Okay. So, anytime you create a class, even if you, you're like, I'm never going to use this class with other objects, with other classes, which is very unlikely then we need to add header guards and we do that uh, if not defined bank can usually this is the best practices right we're like if then define and then down here we say uh, end if okay so those three statements combined are header guards, and I know what you all are thinking, well, what's the purpose of them? So remember, uh, in C++, anytime we want to use string, say we have a program with 10 files and we want to use string in five files, we, we potentially include string five different times. So in C++, if you include something five different times without uh, telling C++ or giving C++ a way to manage all those includes, then C++ will tell us, hey, like this bank account, you've already defined it. So that's what we're doing here. Like we're creating a special variable that C++ can understand, right? So if not defined bank account, then define this variable and then end if, right? So we include it one time, so that variable exists. We include it another time, then C++ comes here, and C++ is like, oh, it is defined. So then C++ will not include this code into its large compilation file that goes into the compiler for compiling. So then we won't get those issues where we will see like that bank account has been defined more than one time, right? So that's the whole purpose of header guards. It's uh, for accounting, uh, helping C++ manage the number of times we include it, right? We can include it 100 times as with header guards, and C++ only includes it one time in that large file that we have for compiling. Questions here? So I always tell students, like, just add it. Like, even if you know, like, you're like, nah, I'm never going to use this class anywhere else. You know, just at the header guards, and if someone else does that, then you won't have to trace down uh, syntax errors. Okay. So we have that, and then we can go back here, and then we can mimic a private functions, right? We'll say get balance from a database. Let me think here. Yeah, I'll do that mainly because I brought it up in the diagram, right? So for now, we'll say, well, I'll just return a hard-coded value. And then in the next class, we'll let the code that generates uh, random, right? So we'll do this, and for now, I'll just say return, I don't know, 1,000. Okay, so at least now we more or less have the code that we have here. And the encapsulation example, right, where the get balance from db function would go to database, retrieve our balance, we don't do that in this class, so we'll just uh, mimic that piece. Okay, so now 
in C++, we have what, five minutes, right? Any time in C++, or the only time in C++ where you want functions to be writable is when you know that those functions have to be writable. Get balance, does it have to be writable? Meaning like, can we, I mean, do we want it to be rewrite? Probably not. Mainly because we're saying get balance. And that translates into, well, give me the current balance, like as it stands right now. I don't want it with interest. I don't want it with some withdrawal that just came in. I just want the balance that's in the database right now. Okay, so to what am I trying to say, right? So maybe my mistake, we're like, right, so notice that statement here, whether it was by mistake or somebody was testing, I don't know, somebody messed up, right? And then we uh, go and run the code. We have 100, 200, right? Nothing outrageous. But we do not want this kind of statements in here. We do, don't want people to, or programmers to modify the balance. So we're like, oh, okay, so, so we can lock it down by using our friend cons, right? So and then we come here. And then if I uh, try to say balance plus equal. 100 and then I try to run it then now it's telling me that balance is read only and uh, the rule in C++ is unless you are absolutely sure that you need to modify something in a function make the function const so we know that this one's like a no-brainer, kind of like a balance. Yeah, we don't want anyone to modify it. So then we do that. We come back to compile and run it. And now we're good, right? So nobody can modify the balance when we, we request it, okay? And uh, for today, I think we've uh, done enough. Uh, for the next next class, make sure you're here because you'll get a freebie for homework, right? We'll start the tic tac toe. We'll, we'll, I'll go to like 6 15, 6 20, and then the rest of the class, like, we'll, we'll complete homework, uh, the next homework here. And uh, it'll be kind of like a lecture homework, right? So you get a freebie. And that'll get you started on the tic tac toe application. Later on, when you're like two, three weeks down the road, you'll be like, oh, no wonder you gave me that one free, right? Because the homeworks do get more complicated. Uh, so again, we'll do the deposit uh, function, withdraw function. We'll enable get balance with RAND numbers. And then we will uh, uh, finish homework one in class. Okay, so let me stop the recording. So.